3. And it's the last sermon in our Philippian sermon, um, sermon series. Oh, and if you uh, do not have a paper Bible and would like a paper Bible, then feel free to raise your hand. Before we begin, let me pray. Uh, dear gracious Lord, thank you so much for your word. Um, thank you for how it uh, pierces even to dividing soul and spirit, Lord. Um, I pray that you would please teach us with your word and show us what contentment looks like. Um, I pray that you would help Ben to preach your word faithfully. Um, yeah, I pray this please in Jesus' name. Amen. Philippians chapter 4, verse 10. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me gifts. Well, you sent me aid more than once when I was in need. Not that I desire your gifts. What I desire is that more be credited to your account. I have received full payment and have more than enough. I am amply su supplied, now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent. They are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Verse 21. Greet all God's people in Christ Jesus. The brothers and sisters who are with me send greetings. All God's people here send you greetings, especially those who belong to Caesar's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Thanks, Abby. It is my first um, sermon here as your pastor, um, but every week. Um, I've been in uh, Sunday school and youth group with the teams, and we've been um, teaching, proclaiming God's word to them. So it's a privilege for me to be here with you this morning uh, to teach God's word as well. So this term, we've been going through the New Testament letter of Philippians in our series, Joy-Filled Servants. And today we're looking at the final passage to close out the series and you might have noticed during the reading, chapter 4 is a bit of a, a bit like a highlights reel of the book of Philippians. Um, Paul's reflected on most of the big themes he's been talking about. Uh, there's rejoicing, partnership in the gospel, God's sovereign power, spiritual fruit, the supreme worth of knowing Jesus Christ, church unity, God's glory, and God's grace. But there's one new theme uh, that Paul's going to bring um, in this passage, which is contentment. And uh, that's what we're going to spend most of our time looking at this morning. And we're going to see that it's closely linked to what Paul has already taught uh, throughout this letter. Now, our pre-sermon question, I asked you, if you could change one thing in your life, uh, what would it be? Uh, now, I'm sure you had lots of different answers. Uh, if I just had better grades, uh, a bit more money, a better job, more respect in my workplace, maybe a special someone in your life, a uh, better marriage, more time with the kids, maybe better physical or mental health or family members who aren't so needy. Maybe you just wanted a holiday, maybe you just wanted to get away from it all. If I just had that, then I would be happy. Then I would be content. Just out of interest, did anyone say nothing? Did anyone say nothing? They wanted for nothing? Maybe one person at the back there. Go and talk to them later. They uh, might have already learnt the secret of contentment. Uh, but for the rest of us, I think God, something got, God has got something to say to all of us today about how we can be content with who we are, who we're with, what we have, and where we're at. So let's get into the passage and see what God has to say to us this morning. Uh, Paul starts this section recalling the partnership that he and the Philippians have in the gospel. He says, I rejoiced greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. 
Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. Now, Paul's talking about his, uh, their concern for his physical needs, uh, their financial, that's financial support, personal care. And that's so he can stay alive, right? Because he's in, he's in prison in Rome. And it's also so he can continue to share the gospel, uh, people around him and supporting, writing letters to other churches. And remember, uh, if you remember right back to the beginning of the series, uh, Paul's already talked about this. Um, he talks about their partnership in the gospel with them. He said, I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Paul's going to talk more about this partnership soon. But now that he's brought it up, he takes the opportunity for a teachable moment. So if you're taking notes in your series booklet, this is our first point. God provides everything we need. So in the middle of thanking the Philippians for their renewed partnership in the gospel, Paul reflects on how he has learned to be content in all circumstances, confident that God will provide all of his needs. He says, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I'm in need, but I have learned to be content, whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. So Paul has learned the secret of contentment. Whatever his circumstances, whether good or bad, whether he's prospering or whether um, he's in need, he's learned to be content in any and every situation. But hold on a minute, let's, let's slow down a bit. Uh, what is contentment? What are we even talking about? Um, Willis gave a stab at a definition earlier. We're going we're gonna to see. Um, the Greek word Paul uses can mean um, an, ex an external state of having what is adequate or sufficient. Uh, to have enough of everything you need or want, to not be dependent on anyone else uh, for your needs. But it can also mean an internal state, an attitude of being satisfied with your circumstances, an inner self-sufficiency that can be sustained, whatever is going on around you, whatever your external condition. So in, back in Paul's day, uh, the Greek philosophers known as the Stoics, they prided themselves on attaining this second type of contentment. They taught a strict uh, asceticism that required rigorous self-discipline, extensive development of, of inner resources, which they believed enabled them to face good and bad, gain and loss, even life and death, with unflinching composure and emotional detachment. Uh, it's a bit like uh, Spock from Star Trek, if you think of that. But what, what Paul's talking about here is more like this second type of contentment, the unchanging inner contentment in the face of changeable circumstances, but he goes beyond the self-sufficiency of the Stoics. For Paul, contentment is not the passive acceptance of the status quo, but the positive assurance that God will supply your needs and the resulting freedom from a necessary desire or worry that comes from that. Rather than training in a particular mindset or drawing upon your own internal resources, it's drawing upon the resources that God supplies and resting in the assurance of God's ability to meet your needs. So Christian contentment is an internal attitude or posture of trust in God's gracious provision to supply all of your needs, whatever the circumstances. Now, significantly, contentment is the exact opposite of grumbling and complaining, of greed and selfish ambition, and of covetousness. Now, coveting is an old word. Um, we don't use it much anymore, except maybe when a sports person is coveting a prize. Um, but coveting is an old word which means to desire something that you don't currently possess, especially something that belongs to someone else or is not yours to have. And there's lots of places in the Bible that we can look to uh, which show the dangers of coveting rather than being content in God. Uh, places like the, the Tenth Commandment, for example. The Bible's also full of plenty of warnings about, and cautionary tales about greed and the love of money. It's one of the things that Jesus taught about in the Gospels more than anything else. But Paul sums up these two opposite attitudes side by side in one of his other letters, in his letter to Timothy. Here's what he says. He says, But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Then the other side. 
Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Now, if that all sounds a bit strange to you, uh, there's a good reason for that. It's almost the exact opposite to what our culture believes today. We live in an incredibly rich and affluent society in one of the richest countries in the world in one of the most privileged times in human history. And our secular culture encourages, it even celebrates greed. After all, it's the driver for our consumer uh, economy. We have every modern convenience, luxury and entertainment at our fingertips. But we're never satisfied. We always want the next thing. The latest phone, the new car, the hottest fashion, the next season of that show. Even if we can't afford it, we can buy now, pay later in four easy payments, or pay it on the credit card or, or yoke ourselves to the bank for the next 25 to 30 years. I think if there's a song that describes what our culture is like, it's got to be this one from Queen. This is my show, my age. I want it all, I want it all, I want it all, and I want it now. Or uh, just pick this up this morning. Maybe this is more current. Um, shout out if you know it. I've got gadgets, I've got gadgets and gizmos are plenty. I've got who's it's and what's it's galore. You want thing of me, Bobs? I've got twenty. But who cares? No big deal. I want more. What is it? There it is. Little mermaid. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> I want more. I want more. I want it all. I want it now. This all means we really need to listen closely to God's word on this topic. This is a massive blind spot in our culture today. We're in danger of falling into the traps of discontentment, of greed, and of coveting things that are not ours to have, even being tempted to wander away from Jesus. Okay, so we know what contentment is. Uh, Contentment is an internal attitude of uh, trusting in God's gracious provision for all of your needs, whatever the circumstances. And we know that the opposite is grumbling, greed, and desiring what we don't already have. So, back in our passage, now we know what we're talking about. Paul says that even though he's grateful for the support the Philippians have sent him, he's learned the secret of contentment. I'm not saying this because I'm need, for I've learned to be content, whatever the circumstances. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. Notice that Paul says he's learned the secret of contentment. This has been a process for Paul. He didn't just wake up one day and he was content. He's had to grow in understanding what it means to be content as he's followed Jesus and faced all kinds of different experiences. Now, we know from earlier in this letter that Paul's in prison, in chains in Rome, awaiting his trial. But we also heard of some of the ups and downs of Paul's uh, missionary experience uh, in our last series in the book of Acts. Um, Here's a a list. I won't uh, go through them all. Um, But here's just some of the things that Paul faced. He gives this list in 2 Corinthians 11. He was frequently in prison. Uh, He was flogged severely. He was stoned. Um, He was shipwrecked. He was in constant danger. Paul hasn't been some reclusive guru who's been off attaining some higher level of enlightenment on spiritual retreats. That's not how he's found contentment. He's been on the front line. He's been pioneering in gospel ministry throughout the Roman Empire and taking all the hits along the way. But along the way, he's learned to depend more and more upon God to provide for his needs and care for him, whatever situation he finds himself in. And Paul isn't just boasting about what he's attained, he's exhorting the Philippians to learn the secret to contentment too. He wants them to imitate his example, as he said um, earlier in the letter. And how has Paul been able to face being in need, having plenty, being well-fed or hungry? By relying on the Lord to strengthen him. Now, um, as we, we, this came up in our Bible study um, during the week, clearly this isn't something that Paul uh, does in his own strength. It's not a grim, stoic self-discipline or a Buddhist-like detachment from physical, emotional, and social desires. Paul clearly recognizes and acknowledges that he's experienced being well-fed or hungry, living in plenty or in want. Paul knows he doesn't have what it takes. He knows his own inner resources won't be enough to get him through difficult situations. But in the middle of his experience of these things, he relies on God to give him strength to persevere. Paul has learned to rely on God's provision to look to him for strength in whatever situation he's in, to trust in God's sovereign power 
in his fatherly care. What's this look like in my life? Um, well, it's certainly changed a lot over the years. Uh, at the end of high school, I was working at a news agent. Uh, that allowed me a bit more, the, the income from that allowed me a bit more freedom and independence while I was living at home. Then during uni, I was uh, doing vac work in the holidays as an engineering student. Um, I'd make a couple of grand and then uh, through the year, through the term, just watch it dwindle away to nothing. Um, I think I even had to take a loan from my dad to buy an engagement ring for Corinne uh, before we got married. That's where I was at. When we got graduated and got married, uh, we had uh, you know, double income, no kids. We had more than enough to give generously to church and missionaries. We still had plenty left over for our savings, eating out, going away for the weekend. But now we've got kids, we're raising a young family. Our finances are stretched a bit tighter. Um, we've got to watch our spending and there's not that much going into the savings. Looking back, we've, we've made some sacrifices and there have been some tight patches. But for the most part, I've been fairly content and not worried about having enough for what we need. But to be honest, uh, lately I've been struggling a bit with contentment. When I catch up with my friends from uni and visit their houses, I find myself going, wow, look at your place. Look at all the space you have for your family and uh, all for having people over. and Look at all your nice stuff. I start to get a bit jealous. I start to wish I had what they had. The little townhouse that we rent is nice enough. It's a bit cosy, but we make it work. Some of our rooms double as playrooms, art studios, Lego building stations, home offices, and music practice rooms. But we make it work. We still love to have people over and share life with them. It'd be really nice if we just had a bigger place. Maybe if my parents, you know, they've paid off their house now, maybe if they could help us buy somewhere. Or if we knew someone who'd be willing to rent us an investment property in a, in a good location. I'm not sure we'll ever be able to afford a house in this market. But I need to remember how God has been faithful to me over so many years. How he's provided for everything I need and more. I have so much to be thankful for. And I'm sure, more sure now than I was before that God is good and he knows what's best. He's my loving Heavenly Father who will provide for all of my needs. And he gives us everything we need as we keep following him where he leads. How about you? Are you content in your current situation? Or are you putting your hope of fulfillment and satisfaction in something else? If I just had, then I would be content. Are you relying on the Lord to strengthen you through difficult circumstances? Or are you trying to do this in your own strength, drawing upon your own resources and doggedly uh, pushing through? God wants you to know this morning that if you're trusting in Jesus, then you are united to him by faith. He is in you and you are in him. He is committed to completing the good work that he's begun in you. As you work out your salvation with fear and trembling, it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purposes. He will strengthen you to endure whatever you're facing right now as you trust in him to provide for your needs. Like Paul, it will take us time to learn this type of contentment, but God is committed to helping us as we grow in trusting him in all these things. And our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, will strengthen us so we can do all of this. So, so far, we've learned that God provides everything we need. And the secret to contentment is trusting in God's gracious provision. Okay, so what's all the fuss? Why is contentment so important? Why does Paul want the Philippians to learn the secret of contentment as he has? God provide, provides everything we need so we can serve and give joyfully. As Paul recounts the Philippians' long-term partnership in gospel ministry, he's careful to clarify that his primary concern is not his personal benefit from their gifts, what he's getting out of it. What he's most concerned about is their spiritual fruitfulness and their worship of God. He says, not that I desire your gifts. What I desire is that more be credited to your account. I've received full payment and have more than enough. I am amply supplied. Now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, they are a fragrant offering, 
an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. Paul is thankful for their their long term. Uh, sorry. Yet it was good for you to share. Sorry. Uh, okay. Sorry. Okay. So Paul is thankful for their their long term service. Um, their faithful and at times exclusive partnership in the gospel. He says it was good of them to share in his troubles and that. Um, no, yeah, notice there that their partnership with Paul equates to sharing in his troubles. Um, they're in this together with him. As he suffers for the gospel, um, they suffer with him as they give and serve and pray. And notice too that they'd signed up um, straight away. Uh, from the beginning when they first heard and believed the gospel, um, they had jumped on board to support Paul. They wanted to give back for what they had received and ensure more people could hear about Jesus just as they had. And they'd continued to support Paul. They'd continued to support Paul through thick and thin, even when other churches had discontinued their support for different reasons. So Paul can say that the Philippians have more than repaid their debt to him. He has everything he needs and more. They don't owe him anything. But he says he has a higher goal than personal benefit from their gifts. What he's really interested in is their spiritual fruitfulness. He says, what I desire is that more be credited to your account. Or in the ESV, I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. Just as Paul prayed back in chapter 1, he prayed that the Philippians, their love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. And he prayed that they might be filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ. Paul's greatest desire for the Philippians is that the gospel bears fruit in their lives. And he counts their partnership with him as evidence that the gospel is at work in them. He wants to see more and more spiritual fruit in their lives. After all, if a fruit tree or a vine is healthy, it produces lots of fruit, right? Our willingness to give and serve in ministry is the outworking of the gospel in our lives. How encouraging was it last week to see so many people at the Serving Expo signing up to serve and um, help out in different ministry areas? And I don't know if you noticed in the email, but what an encouragement in the last week to see people giving generously towards our church budget. We went over and above our weekly goal. We knocked $10,000 off this year's shortfall. How good is that? We can praise God that he is producing gospel fruit in our lives here at CPE Church. But wouldn't it be great to see more of this spiritual fruit? More fruit as we step up to fill the gaps in our ministry teams. More fruit as we give generously and sacrificially to meet budget. More fruit as we love each other and share life together in practical ways throughout the week. More fruit as we share Jesus with our gospel friends, more fruit as we partner with gospel workers and missionaries to share Jesus here in Australia and overseas. How good would that be to see more spiritual fruit? But wait, there's more. Uh, Paul says that these practical gifts that the Philippians have given to him, they're actually an expression of worship to God. He says, I've received full payment, have more than enough. I am amply supplied now that I have received your gifts. He says, but they are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. Now, if you're familiar with your Old Testament, Paul is using the language of the sacrificial system of the Jewish people. When God's people would offer him sacrifices of animals, the fruit of their crops, the oil and wine offerings. And just imagine it, try and smell it. It's burnt meat, uh, roasted meat being burnt on the altar. There's uh, aromatic spices mixed in with the the oil and wine offerings poured out before God. Uh, Or um, sometimes the offerings were shared with the priests and uh, other people you could eat uh, the the offerings together in a great big feast in God's name. That was the picture of the, the sacrificial system in the Old Testament. Paul's drawing upon that imagery because he's saying that the Philippians' gifts of financial support and their their practical help, even in the form of of sending people like Epaphroditus, they're ultimately received by God as precious acts of sacrificial devotion and praise. And God's very pleased with them. Whether they realized it or not, when they responded to God's grace in Jesus by giving and serving in gospel partnership, they weren't just meeting the needs of other people on a horizontal level. They're actually worshiping God. 
And the same is true for us. Your giving and your serving here at CPE as part of a ministry team, uh, informally, as you love and care for, for members of your life group, uh, or as you support the ministry of Christian workers and missionaries, uh, your giving and serving, when done in response to what God has first done for you in the gospel, your giving and serving is, first of all, worship to God, even before it's of horizontal benefit to the people around you. So we've got contentment, knowing God provides all of our needs, and we've got giving and serving, which is a fruit of the gospel and received as worship to God. But how does this dynamic work? How do these things work together? How can contentment free us to give and serve for the sake of the gospel? Well, it's a bit like ballast in a ship. Uh, ballast is that weight deep down in the hull of the ship uh, that keeps it steady no matter what's happening around it. Uh, old ships used to use like heavy rocks, soil or cargo. Can you see the, the rocks in the bottom there? Under the, under the planks. Um, these days, it's more often water that's pumped into a compartment in the bottom of the ship. But the, the ballast uh, in the ship, it stops the ship from rolling and pitching in a storm or, or listing to one side when it's, or even capsizing when it's got to carry a heavy load. Uh, the ballast is the weight that keeps the ship steady and stable no matter what's happening to it. You see, when we know uh, that we can never lose what we value most, Jesus Christ, our great and glorious Saviour who's always with us to strengthen and sustain us. When we know we can't lose that, then we don't need to be worried about what's happening around us in our life. When we know we already have everything we need in Jesus and nothing can take that away, then we're freed up to, uh, uh, from all the things that get in the way of giving and serving. Things like worrying about the future, grumbling about our troubles, coveting things that we don't have or, or focusing on seeking our own needs and wants. It even means we can give up things for the sake of serving Jesus and sharing the gospel. So we've already seen this, but is the gospel, I want to ask you, is the gospel bearing fruit in your life? Is the good news of the gospel moving you to respond um, by offering your life, by offering your whole self to serve God? Are you trusting in the Lord to provide for all of your needs so you can give and serve generously and sacrificially. You don't need to wait until you've got everything in your life sorted uh, before you start giving and serving. And when we start to learn contentment, trusting God's sovereign care and fatherly provision, we can start giving and serving straight away, just like the Philippians did when they first heard and received the gospel. Straight away, they wanted to be on Paul's team in partnership with Paul uh, to get the gospel out. Do you think about your giving and serving as an act of of worship, not just a, a horizontal meeting the practical needs of, of people around you, not just filling holes in the ministry roster or, or cooking a meal for someone or helping out, but a vertical act of worship that is, that is pleasing to God. First of all, an act of worship to Him. Are you using your time, your treasure, and your talents to worship God, the only one who deserves all glory and praise? Every gospel need is an opportunity uh, to give and serve sacrificially. Uh, a challenge for us to be content in the Lord and let go of those things we would otherwise cling to for our security, uh, our, for our comfort, for our happiness and satisfaction. And more than that, every opportunity to give and serve sacrificially, both here at church or in the mission of seeing the gospel go out to our city, our nation and our world, it's an opportunity to joyfully worship the Lord with our time, our treasure and our talents, everything that he's given us so we've seen that God provides everything we need so we can give and serve joyfully gospel partnership is a precious uh, spiritual fruit of God's work in our lives and it's pleasing worship to God well in the, the final section we're in the home straight now Paul brings both of the, uh, these ideas contentment and gospel partnership uh, together with a final assurance of the Lord's gracious provision in Christ and a final call to glorify God in everything. God provides everything we need in Christ Jesus so we can give and serve joyfully for God's glory. Paul closes his letter with a reassurance that God will provide for the Philippians' physical and spiritual needs in Christ Jesus, just as Paul himself has experienced. And this brings God glory forever and ever. Uh, verse 19, And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. 
Greet all God's people in Christ Jesus. The brothers and sisters who are with me send greetings. All God's people here send you greetings, especially those who belong to Caesar's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Paul is confident that God will supply all of their needs according to his measureless riches in Christ Jesus. What was implicit in verse 13, Paul now states explicitly in verse 19, and my God will meet all of your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. This is a work of grace. It's the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ for them. Of course he will. He's not just Paul's God. He's now our God and Father. And if you're trusting in Jesus, then uh, God's already given us everything in him. Through Jesus' humble, we've learned this in Philippians, through Jesus' humble sacrifice, we have reconciliation with God. Our sins are forgiven. We're now considered righteous, accepted and loved by God. And we're now counted as his children and citizens of heaven. God is now for us. He committed to providing for all of our needs, both now and always, according to the richness and fullness of his divine providence. He will supply every need of ours in a glorious manner which shows his adorable grace and providential love will be revealed in Christ Jesus. Those united to Christ by faith and in fellowship with him experience all the benefits and blessing of God's full provision for the needs of his people. Okay, you might be thinking, that all sounds nice, but what exactly does Paul mean by God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus? Does he mean physical needs or just spiritual needs? Well, we can certainly say that this includes spiritual needs as Paul has been uh, praying for these things for the Philippians and throughout his other letters he speaks of the, the riches of Christ and the spiritual blessings that, he, that are the inheritance, the possession of all believers in Christ Jesus. But Paul is obviously also speaking about meeting their physical needs. Think about the context, right? That's exactly what's been happening in their gospel partnership. God has been supplying Paul's physical needs through the Philippians believers, through the Philippian believers. That's been a major theme throughout this letter and the passage Uh, the partnership between fellow believers, between brothers and sisters in Christ, even between different churches scattered around the Roman Empire, all united in the spreading of the gospel message and building up believers everywhere. And God still works the same way. Uh, God can provide and sometimes does provide for our needs in miraculous and unexpected ways. I've experienced that at times. But more commonly, he does this through other believers and the wider Christian church. There's no doubt that Paul places a high value on the unity and partnership of Christians, both within the local church and between different churches. But it's God's good design that he so often works in and through each of us to meet each other's needs and partner to share the good news of the gospel. Which means he can use you, he can use you to supply the needs of people around you or the needs of our church ministries or the needs of Christian ministries and missions beyond our church. We've all got a part to play in gospel partnerships with our time, our treasure, and our talents. But this can only happen when we've learned to be content with what God has already given us. For only when a community of believers or a network of churches are trusting in God's gracious provision can they take their eyes off our own needs and at once and so we can give and serve to meet the needs of others. As, as Paul reflects on all of this and the riches of God's glories in Christ Jesus, he can't help but burst out in praise to God. Uh, this, is, this is how he finishes. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. God deserves all honour and praise for his faithful provision and his loving care. And you can't help, as you read Paul's writings, you can't help but feel his passion for Jesus and the gospel. He's so confident that God provides everything we need in Jesus. As I was preparing, I came across... Uh, this story, it's a bit more like an apocryphal tale. It's uh, very unlikely to be actual history. Um, but uh, it's an interesting story that I think gives a perspective that's, that's worth, worth looking at. Um, there's a story, uh, legend has it that there's a wealthy merchant during Paul's day. Uh, and he's heard about the apostle and he's become so fascinated that he's determined to visit him. So when he's passing through Rome, he gets in touch with Timothy and he arranges an interview with Paul, the prisoner. Stepping inside his cell, the merchant is surprised to find the apostle looking rather old and physically frail. But he feels at once the strength, the serenity and the magnetism of this man who relies on Christ as his all in all. They talk for some time and finally the merchant leaves. Outside the cell, he asks Timothy, what's the secret of this man's power? I've never seen anything like it before. 
Did you not guess, replies Timothy, Paul was in love. The merchant looks puzzled. In love? Yes, said Timothy, Paul was in love with Jesus Christ. The merchant, he looks even more bewildered. Is that all? He asks. Timothy smiles and replies, that is everything. Now, this may not be a true story, but you can just imagine that this is the sort of thing that could be said about Paul. Knowing and following Jesus was his all-consuming obsession. He counted everything else as loss compared to the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus as Lord. That's the secret of contentment. To be captivated by Christ as your everything. The fullness of God's sovereign provision and fatherly care for you to meet your every need in Jesus. Constantly seeking to know more and more of Christ as the ultimate goal of your life will result in greater contentment with your circumstances and in turn greater willingness to give and serve for God's glory. Do you believe that God can meet all of your needs in Christ Jesus? Because the good news is that he already has. In sending Jesus to die for your sins so that you could be saved, the righteous for the unrighteous to bring you back to God. Are you, Christian, are you pressing on to know Christ more and more as the ultimate goal of your life? Like Paul, are you seeking to know him and the power of his resurrection and even participate in his sufferings for the sake of the gospel? Only as we do this, as we rest in the sovereign provision and love and care of our God and Father, who supplies all our needs according to the unfathomable, inexhaustible, everlasting riches of his glory in Christ Jesus, only as we remember everything we have in Jesus can we know contentment and perfect peace. So what have we learned about the secret to contentment? We need to trust in the the sovereign control and the loving care of our God and Father so we can be content whatever situation we're facing as God provides for our every need in Christ Jesus, our Lord and Saviour. And why is contentment so important? Because it frees us up from worry, from greed, self-reliance that might otherwise distract us so we can joyfully give and serve in gospel partnership for God's glory. God provides everything we need in Jesus Christ so we can give and serve joyfully for God's glory. Paul shares the secret of contentment, the reassurance of God's gracious provision and the glorious riches in Christ Jesus, the reason that bids us not to be anxious about anything but to pray and know God's peace because he wants us to, to free us from the things that hinder us from loving one another as Christ has loved us. The things that stop us from seeking unity and peace. The things that cause us to be distracted by worldly concerns or, or flesh-gratifying false teaching. The things that stop us from serving sacrificially for God's glory. The things that stop us from giving generously to meet the needs of the saints. The things that get in the way of our mission to share the good news of the gospel to people who don't yet know our precious Saviour. We know who we are. We know where we're headed. We know who's keeping us safe. We already have everything in Jesus. So there's nothing we have to fear or be anxious about or worry that we're missing out on. We can serve sacrificially and give generously to God's mission in worship to our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ, because God provides everything we need in Him. Let's pray and give Him all the glory now. Why don't you join me in prayer? Lord God and Heavenly Father, thank you for the gospel, for the good news of Jesus Christ. Thank you that in him we have everything. That you are now our, our God and Father committed to, to caring for our every need. Lord God, help us to be uh, people who are pursuing the Lord Jesus, seeking to know him more and more. Um, but may that be the great ambition, the great goal of our lives. And as we do this, may we know contentment uh, with our, whatever situation we're facing, with whatever circumstances we experience so that we can serve you um, faithfully, so we can uh, worship you with our time, our treasure, and our talents, and give and serve to meet the needs of those around us. We pray that we might do this in the name of the G uh, Lord Jesus Christ and for his glory. Amen. Now to um, reflect on what we've heard from God.